between the orbiter, uh, the firing room here at Kennedy Space Center, and Houston. The booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94 percent. Normal throttle uh, for most of the flight, 104 percent. We'll throttle down to 65 uh, percent shortly. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. Hello. What you just saw was one of the most tragic events in the history of NASA. You just witnessed the explosion of the 25th mission out of the 135 carried out during the space shuttle era, which lasted 30 years, from 1981 to 2011. What I'm referring to is the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, which happened on 28th of January 1986, merely 73 seconds into launch. But before we focus on this disaster, let's take a look at the history of Space Shuttle Challenger. Before its imminent explosion, Space Shuttle Challenger was involved in nine previous missions first one being in 1983, where it already began to set records. In fact, in its first mission, STS-6, Space Shuttle Challenger set the record for the first spacewalk of the shuttle program, as well as the record for deploying the first satellite of the Track and Data Relay System, which is a network of satellites used by NASA for communication in space. The shuttle set many other records, such as launching the first American women into space, Sally Ride. Other accomplishments include being the first shuttle to launch and land at night, having its astronauts perform the first untethered spacewalk, and being the shuttle from which the first female spacewalk is performed from. A less positive record, Space Shuttle Challenger is the first manned space shuttle to explode. As mentioned before, on January 28, 1986, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Space Shuttle Challenger's 10th mission, STS-51L, approximately 73 seconds after launch, disintegrated killing all crew members. Originally planned to launch on January 22nd, the mission was delayed seven times, finally encountering ideal launch conditions on January 28th. The event was broadcasted live on national television in the USA, as well as many other channels around the world. As for what caused the disaster, post-disaster analysis has revealed various aspects that may or may not have caused the explosion. At 0.678 seconds after launch, Photometric data from various cameras starts revealing various instances in which an unusual dark gray puff of smoke is emitted from around 270 and 310 degrees of the circumference of the right solid rocket booster. This photometric data leads to the conclusion that there is a fault in the rubber O-rings which are being burnt by the heat and thus are not properly sealing the SRB joint, which as a result oscillates as depicted. Different photometric data reveals another issue later on in the flight. At around 58 seconds from launch, a small flame is noticed once again on the right solid rocket booster, at the same exact location as the gray smoke puffs from before. Rotational movement of the shuttle, combined with the resistance provided by the air, causes the plume to start spreading throughout the surface of the right solid rocket booster. At around 64 seconds from launch, an abrupt change in color and shape of the plume indicates the mixing of the plume with the internal components of the rocket booster, thus indicating a leak of hydrogen, which is now being burned by the plume. The leak of hydrogen was confirmed by telemeter data of the hydrogen tank pressures. 
At 72 seconds, the connection between the rocket booster and the external tank is severed, thus causing the rocket booster to rotate in an unpredicted manner. This leads to a chain of events which eventually leads to the release of a massive amount of hydrogen gas, thus causing a void which causes the tank to suffer the forward thrust of about 2.8 million pounds, which pushes the hydrogen tank to upwards into the intertank structure, which at the same time is impacted by the rotating rocket booster. This finally leads to the explosion of the entire structure at an altitude of 46,000 feet, claiming both vehicle and crew. It is concluded now that the explosion was caused by a long chain reaction which was initiated by a flaw in the design of the O-rings. That being said, I recommend watching the official Space Shuttle Challenger disaster investigation documentary sponsored by NASA, which can get quite boring, but does a better job than I did when it comes to analyzing the causes of the disaster. STS-51L's crew was composed of Francis R. Scobie, Michael J. Smith, Judith A. Resnick, as in S. Onizuka, Ronald E. McNair, Gregory B. Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe. Speaking of which, Krista McAuliffe was actually supposed to be the first civilian, meaning non-astronaut, to go to space. Born on September 2, 1948, Massachusetts raised and with a bachelor degree in history, Sharon Krista McAuliffe spent most of her working career as a history teacher in various high schools in America, quickly earning the reputation of a teacher admired and loved by most of her students. At the arrival of her first son in 1976, Krista, as she was known, started working towards a master's degree in school administration, which, in 1978, she received. She ended up having another son, and eventually, after two births and much studying, returned to teaching. In 1984, NASA became interested in sending a teacher to space. Sending a non-astronaut into space was part of NASA's plan to generate public excitement around the space program. The administration felt that a teacher was a relatable character who, at the same time, could share their experiences efficiently. Having heard of this, and having been fascinated by space all of her life, Krista McCullough quickly compiled the 11-page application and sent it to NASA. A year later, in 1985, she was greeted with the exciting news that she had been selected as the teacher who was to be sent to space. Thus, enthusiastically, she left her job and embarked into the journey that would have led her to space. By the time it was time for launch, she was both mentally and physically ready for the mission. She trained for 100 hours, and even selected her own meals. Come the day of the launch though, well, we all know what happened. On January 28th, 1986, Krista McCall died in the Challenger disaster. So with all this trauma, what were the effects of the Spatial Challenger disaster? Well, a look at a newspaper article by Frank Greenwald published a few days after the incident reveals the following. A controversy sparked. Are manned space journeys worth it or not worth it? The article slightly tackles this question by providing valid points on both sides of the argument, and mentions how certain parties, such as the government, believe that manned missions are required for complex tasks to be carried out, and also how manned missions have actually prevented disasters in the past with the astronauts' ability to overcome technical difficulties. It also mentions, though, how other parties believe that the only reason why complex tasks can be carried out by manned missions only is because not enough attention has been given to the development of the technology required for non-manned missions to carry out complex tasks. After tackling the controversy, the article starts listing the losses that were caused by the disaster. Keep in mind that these are all short-term, as the article was written only five days after the disaster. The losses included in the article are the following. Firstly, well, the loss of seven lives. Secondly, the shuttle itself cost $1 billion, each mission costing up to $250 million. Thirdly, and generally speaking lastly, the $100 million satellite and the $10 million instrument that Space Shuttle Challenger was carrying. The event also caused the suspension of any manned space project. The United States, in fact, did not send any astronaut into space for around three years after the incident. This time gap was to be used by NASA to focus on what went wrong with Space Shuttle Challenger. NASA was to research better, safer, and cheaper options for space travel. It is evident that after the disaster, there was much pressure on NASA to work on their mistakes and improve the space program. In the long term, NASA have somewhat learned from this event. Modern space flights are, in fact, much safer now. NASA have learned how to perform better safety checks and make better decisions. Although safety has been improved, NASA now realizes that space travel is, regardless, always dangerous. Unlike back in 86 when it was believed to be relatively safe. This being said, the safety of space travel is still not perfect, as highlighted by the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, which occurred on February 3, 2003. NASA have also learned less direct or obvious lessons. For example, NASA has realized that space travel is extremely expensive. 
As a result, the administration now relies mostly on private funding rather than public. NASA has learned that traveling through space solely for research is not a business. If they want space travel and research to prosper, NASA knows that they must capitalize, either via commercial flights or via satellites that can capitalize on top of researching. So, despite the numerous disasters and not the cleanest of track records, NASA's space program is still in full effect. Various missions and projects are already planned for the future. These include NASA's Orion spacecraft, which acts as a replacement of the now terminated space shuttle program, and whose goal is to take humans further out to space, into further horizons including distant asteroids, and, in the 2030s, possibly even Mars. Other projects include the Space Launch System, which will act as a vehicle for Orion, as well as research on global avionics. NASA is also involved in current projects such as research into new technologies such as solar sails and advancements in robotics, as well as general research which is being carried out at the International Space Station, which has been in orbit since 1998. Other currently active projects include NASA's Explorers program, which includes 90 missions in which artificial satellites are sent throughout space for scientific research. I chose this topic because I wanted to make sure that I picked something that would interest me. I remember the first job that I've ever aspired to have was being an astronaut. My passion for astronomy is still very strong, so an astronomy-related topic like this one was perfect for me. Despite the fact that Space Shuttle Challenger's 10th mission was a tremendous disaster which shook the nation and most probably hit NASA very hard, I believe that the people working in NASA don't After the 28th of high January, 1986, which NASA truly inspires me. After the 28th of January, 1986, NASA didn't just stop and give up. They accepted their mistakes and decided to learn from them. NASA decided to strive for better. They didn't accept that they had reached their maximum output, and they didn't believe it. One of the most common virtues of life is to not let your failures stunt you, but rather to accept and learn from them, and use the experiences learned from these failures to work to some improvements, to something better. NASA did exactly that. They learned valuable lessons from the disaster, and now they are soaring towards the future, with the past in their pockets, and the edge of space as the limit.